and myself, we would like to welcome you to the Tri-3 Dr. Bag Ceremony. We are here today to celebrate you guys because you are finishing the final round of your basic science courses and you're getting ready to go into some of your clinical science courses. And we want to make sure that you have the tools that you need in order to be successful in your coursework. So there are some very important people here with us today who want to say a few words uh, of congratulations to you to wish you well as you get ready to jump into Tri-4 in a few weeks, okay? So first, I want to bring to the podium um, someone that you guys all know, our president, Dr. William E. Gordon. So congratulations. This is a large class. How many people are in this class? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all of you. Okay. So congratulations. And this is, you know, we like to make a ceremony out of this because it is important, the transition. You're going from your undergrad to be doctors in training. And these bags represent being a doctor. And the tools in those are valuable. And we want you to keep these. And I still have tools from 35 years ago when I was doing <laughs> my ceremony. And I use them. And they are a big part of your practice. Now, you're going to be adjusting your, your chiropractors. I get it. But when somebody tells you, oh, that ain't chiropractic, everything you learn here is chiropractic. So I'd have been in practice 13 years, and I got picked up to go to Bethesda Naval Hospital for a research project. And there were some medical doctors didn't want a chiropractor there. This is back in, in the 90s. And they were kind of pushed this back and fought us a little bit. So like the first week there, I had a patient come in, referred. He, he had headaches and some other issues. He'd been to physical therapy and several medical doctors. And he came in. I'm doing my interview. And I'm doing the report. My, the, the, uh, History, just like you're going to learn to take on every patient, a review assistant. So I went down and talked about his ears. So he goes, yeah, I, I had had some ear, ear pain, and I can't hear very well out of this ear. So I took my scope out, like you have in your doctor bag. I looked in this good ear, great tympanic and great. Looked in the other ear, this gray pulpy mass. His entire middle ear was gone, eaten by a pseudomonas infection. Plus, he, he smelled bad from the pseudomonas. So we make a referral, get an x-rays, and refer him to a medical doctor, back to his medical doctor. We had a pseudomonas infection of his mastoid process. If I had adjusted him, and it had been eroded, the mastoid had been eroded to eggshell thinness. If I had adjusted him, I would have probably broken his mastoid, introduced the pseudomonas infection to his brain, sad Christmas. So, um, you know, so by referring it, it got, word got around the hospital like, that the chiropractor found what all these medical doctors had missed. By master, being a master of your craft, and your craft includes every tool at the disposal of a doctor. You are doctors. You spend a lot of money in this education, and you're here to become doctors. This is not a religion. This is a profession. Please hold on to these. Value them. Treat them with respect. Become masters of them, just like I want you to master the adjustment. These are important, and you are becoming doctors. And people, you you can use these tools to save people's lives. I can say there's people alive today because of the diagnostic skills I learned in chiropractic college. You, looking back in your career, you will find people whose life that you know what if I had not caught that, they wouldn't be here today. From laboratory, the laboratory diagnosis class, there's three people alive today because of that class. You should move forward with sobriety and and become masters of this. Treat this with respect, but this is just a, a, one of those milestones that we want to celebrate with you, congratulate you on this. So I uh, love being your president, love seeing you guys in person, and um, I hope to, to watch you much more over the next couple of years as, we, as you guys grow to the doctors I know you're going to be. But thank you for being here. Thank you for everything you do. Now, I think we're bringing up our provost, Dr. Jane Michelle, who's, who's going to say a few remarks as well. Okay, I can use the microphone. So I'm your provost. Uh, I went to chiropractic school like you did. 
uh, and it was a really long time ago. And we were given, we weren't given these tools. We had to purchase them ourselves. And we, we held on to them in reverence. And it was a very exciting time for us, as it is for you. Um, it was, it's really a rite of passage. Um, I, was a, I was in practice for uh, 15, 16 years, and then I started in academics. Um, but it's all one thing. You know, you're going to learn a lot here. You're never, hopefully, ever going to stop learning. You're going to use what you learn here and just build on it and build on it until you're like our own president, a master. Uh, I just wanted to say hello and tell you how proud I, I am uh, that all of you have made it this far and are doing so well, and now you have your tools. So it's not only your hands, and that's the great thing about this profession, mostly just our hands, uh, but now we have all these other tools in our arsenal to really be primary doctor and really take care of our patients the way they deserve to be taken care of. So congratulations. I just wanted to say hello and congratulations. And from and now, <laughs> yes, clap. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to bring up to the podium our vice provost, Dr. Patrick Bodner. Just like everyone before me, congratulations on, on reaching this point. And I just want to take this time to just explain a few things because we've, we've all have been where you have been. And I'm a graduate of Parker University and a long history of practicing and, and doing some things within the industry. But uh, there's, there's something I've come to see over and over and over through the years as people evolve through the classes towards graduation is you're always in transition. I don't know if you've noticed that yet. You know, you, uh, if you think back to your first day and, you know, you were really nervous as to whether you could cut it or not, you know, I, I think back to my first day and how scared everyone was in my class. There was one guy in the class who was the most talkative at the, at the time. And, and this was back when Jim Parker was our president. And they had us assemble in this building, which had a very different layout at the time. And uh, we were in a room waiting for someone to come get us to take us to our classroom. And while we're waiting there, you know, the, the guy who talked the most in the class was also the most nervous and had the most doubt about himself. And, and so he started talking to other people and he said, you know, my, my uncle's a chiropractor and he said, it's really hard, but if we all band together, they can't fail us all. <laughs> it's like, we didn't even have our first class yet. We didn't even meet our first instructor. And here this person is preparing everyone to fail. And, and expect failure. And it's a really important thing to notice because you, you transition from that point where, okay, I'm nervous if I can cut it, and, and you survived your first level of exams, and you went on to a process that was what they call competency-based, where you, you went to a class, and the class had a label, and the material in the class hopefully was tied to the label of the class. Um, and, you know, take orthopedics, for example. So you went there and you read about orthopedics, you listened about orthopedics, you watched orthopedics. And then you had to go to a test where someone probably said, you know, pick a card or you were somehow assigned some type of test that you had to perform and do it in front of an instructor. And that was your first time where you were not taking a paper test. And so it was another point of transition. It's like, can I actually perform this? I only have an hour and a half to do three tests. I hope I can do this, right? And um, you, you made it through that point. And, and then you started taking some of your other classes that dealt with patient cases and preparing how to address a patient. It was probably the first time you realized what it's like, oh my gosh, I was supposed to remember everything I learned before because now I got to pull it out for this patient. And now you're moving towards what's called metacompetency learning. And that's what the clinic is. It's a huge classroom that has patients flowing through it, some internal, some external, and it's there for you to apply metacompetency skills. So what that means is, your patient comes in and they say, hey, I'm here because. And maybe you met the patient previously, so you kind of had an idea what the because was, or maybe you didn't, and now you're, it's just coming to you from the paperwork and, and what the patient's saying. And now you have to think back through your arsenal and design a plan of approach for this patient in your mind, right? And you have to look cool the whole time you do it, right? You can't sweat on them or, or anything like that. And you're, you're, you probably learned, what, 1,200 different types of tests throughout your, your didactic experience.
but you're not going to do 1,200 tests on a person who comes in and says, I'm here because. You're going to choose the ones that are specific for that human being in front of you. And that's where it becomes meta-competency. And the best advice I can give you, and I'm going to end really quickly, trust me, I'm going somewhere like this, is, you know, as we were students and we came in here, we all adopted certain behaviors and brought those behaviors with us. And, and those were student behaviors. You know, we dressed certain ways, we sat certain ways, sometimes we fell asleep in certain positions in the class. You know, it just we had all these different habits about us. Um, our study habits, our socialization habits, our, our, let's just leave it at socialization habits. And now you're going into a situation where you're going to be in this meta-competency thing, and you're not quite a doctor yet, but you're learning that process. So if you go into this situation with your mind still as a student, it's not going to work because the education is different, competency versus meta-competency. You have to go into the situation with your head already as a doctor, and you have to speak like someone. You have to have that presence. You know, when you talk to people, communication is just transfers of energy. You know, either they're gonna take your energy or you're gonna take theirs. So you have to be that doctor at that point. You have to dress like someone who earns that respect from a patient and so forth. And then ultimately, you have to realize it's not about you. From this point, it's always been about you, right? Remember when you got your first grades? It was definitely about you. Oh my God, they really screwed up the way they made that test. There's no way I got that question wrong. Okay, even though there was no choice F on the thing, you still put F for some reason, right? So it was always about you. Here, it's not about you any longer, it's about the patient. So you have to go in there with that mindset. And that's all I wanted to do today is share that little thought with you and hopefully you take that with you and it means something and, and you're able to help some people because you're going to hit another trans, uh, trans uh, another time in your life where you change again and that's at graduation. So it's another time where you're shifting gears and, and that's coming up soon and then you're going to be a licensed doctor out in the field and you have to do that. So keep in mind that what you're doing then you should be doing now, or you'll never get to that other point. Make sense? Congratulations. And I am giving the microphone to you. Dr. Person, you're on campus, you're seeing people, pretty amazing, right? Yeah. All right, who remembers? Try one. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, because like you heard my voice a lot. <laughs> so my face, maybe a dog barked in the background. Um, do you guys remember maybe like actually, actually it's this week because I just did this talk again yesterday. You remember when I talked about professionalism? Yeah. Remember how we talked about dress and about attitude and about how you say and what you what your website looks like, what your office looks like, right? And we also talked about tools and chiropractor. They're in front of you. <laughs> it's not just these, right? Not just your hands. It's also these tools and these backs. So as uh, I think Dr. Botnell, Dr. Michelle has said, um, we had to used to have to buy your own doctor's bag. And I think it's kind of amazing that Mrs. Parker's giving you guys the tools. Um, just want to real briefly talk about a little what's in here. Most of the stuff you guys are going to use in your clinical sciences classes. Um, however, and I'm in clinical sciences, so I'm not going to go too far down that path because I'm going to misspeak. But the stuff that's in here, clinical sciences is super important because you have to figure out when you should adjust, but when you should not adjust. As Dr. Morgan said, a couple people are alive today because of lab diagnosis, right? There's tools in here that you guys can learn to actually assess the nervous system. Kind of important as chiropractor, know about the nerves, the muscles, the joints, right? So the stuff in here is really helpful. You guys are going to use it a lot in your clinical skills. You're going to then take that and put it all together for how to assess your patient, what you should do with the patient. So I won't talk too long. I'm not sure if I was supposed to say anything else or not. Um, if I was, please let me know. But congratulations, you guys are try three. I very much look forward to seeing you um, again. And, and again and again. Yeah. <laughs> you made it. Congratulations for all you who are in Tri-Cool's company.
so far is Tri Three. I remember when I was in Tri Three, it was uh, January. I started Tri Three in January 1997. So I know, I know a few of you probably weren't born at that time. Um, but you know, like everyone else here said, we had to buy our own equipment. And when I made the decision to purchase the equipment, I wanted the very best because I knew it was going to last a very long time. And I still have that equipment now. In fact, when I was a clinic doctor, I bought an extra set when I had kids so that I could have it at home. So I've looked into many years. You can imagine, as if, for those who have parents, or who have kids, and of course you all have parents. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, being having that... Uh, skill set and confidence to look in your kid's ear and to make a determination of whether you think you, that your kid needs to go to a doctor or not, I think that's a, um, that's a great skill to have. Uh, I remember when I'm in my first six months of practice, I looked into some person's eye and they didn't speak English, so I had a translator who helped me with the history. And I looked into the eye because they were in an auto accident and I was kind of checking for uh, uh, for pupillary response, and I looked into the person's eye, and you're trained to look for a, a first thing, red light reflex, right? But I didn't see any. So the patient said something. The translator was going to translate something. I'm like, no, I got this. I, I don't need the history. No. I know what I'm doing. Which was the probably the smartest thing to do. I kind of look at it again. I'm like, no, I, I just don't see a reflex. There's something wrong. And then the translator said. He says he has a glass eye. <laughs> I knew that. I just wanted to, I was just fascinated by the color of it. That's why I to it. And uh, that's a true story. Um, you know, when you first start using these tools, you're going to fumble with them, you're going to mess up. Hopefully, you won't poke yourself in the eye with the otoscope, uh, which does happen. Uh, but by the time you get to us in Tri 8, hopefully, by that time, your skills are up to a level where you can actually take care of a real person. So at that time, hopefully you don't poke yourself in the eye because that would probably decrease the confidence of your patient. <laughs> but you know, don't shine the light in your eye. You have to shine the light at the patient first. Um, but I, you know, a lot of us have all these tools when we were in practice and, or as a student. And you, I, hopefully you guys will keep this way beyond graduation for many years and I look forward to seeing you in summer 2023. Oh, I guess yeah. that would be try it, eh? Okay. Cool. We'll see you then. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. So we have another guest that has joined us today. We have Dr. Celia McGuire who is our Dean of Academics for the College of Chiropractic. Would you like to say anything? Sure. She's going to give you guys a good rundown of what's in the bag. So, I'm uh, Dr. Moore, I'm the So, I just can you help me okay? Yes. So, um, the bag as Dr. Moore goes through them, guys, these are, um, very important doctor tools, and for a time, people were buying their own, and they were going to some off-brand websites and getting things that were not durable, and were not, I'll be your fan of that, there you go, and were not helpful for diagnosis, so uh, that's why we, we opted to purchase these for you to get these, these bags, and I just want to say, notice how all of the bags look alike, yeah. so I encourage you to get a, invest in a uh, luggage tag with your name on it, so, uh, and maybe even get one of those, it's called a tile, I have one of my keys. It looks like a credit card size. You drop it in there, and then you can find it uh, if you can place it. Sure. So uh, the first thing is your well challenge. This is your otoscope slash ophthalmoscope. I'm not going to demonstrate how it works. Uh, but I will tell you, just like Dr. Tom was saying, uh, I'm married to a chiropractor, by the way. We're both doctors of chiropractic. Not me. <laughs> and, and, and like, so Dr. Tom had to buy one for home use. Fortunately, we had two. If he, we had one at the practice, and we had one at home. And I had left mine plugged into the wall and the battery exploded. So I had to give mine to my husband to take the practice. So I don't have one at home right now. But it does. It comes in very handy when you're deciding, do I really want to take this pediatrician or not? But we've got the uh, ophthalmoscope and we've got an otoscope. Otoscopes to look in the ears, ophthalmoscopes to look in the eyes. Uh, 
Uh, and as Dr. Hollingsworth mentioned, you know, you're going to use the eye exam also to determine some neurologic uh, components of your exam, which absolutely uh, test the integrity of your nervous system, which is very much what we all agree is chiropractic. And then, of course, looking in the ears can rule out other causes of ear pain and headache and things like that. Uh, these are also specula in here. These are the little things that you attach to the end before you look at somebody's ear. Uh, you probably have some disposable ones in here. Uh, so you'll want to dispose of those in between each patient, and you'll want to stock those uh, in your office. I'll be able to look at them. I was looking for the disposable specula. Oh, that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stethoscope, they would have already had that, right? Yes, that's the part where, where it says travel. three. What now? It says three on the um, far left column. You have, yes, so that's why I was just, we held up the three, now I'm going to know where it is. It says accessories. Oh, this, these are the pinwheels. Okay, so we're going to have to stop here. So you've got the otoscope. That's the looking in the ear thing. Or as uh, I, I heard someone testify one of them ear looker. Uh, calls it an ear looker, but uh, the, the doctor works the otoscope. So this little thing is a pinwheel here. It's a little pokey thing. You drag her across the skin and help you uh, determine if people have good sensory integrity. There should be a thermometer in here. And there are also sheaths. You'll want to use those. So uh, we've got tongue depressors. We have two more kinds of tuning forks. Now, do I thought that was a good point. Uh, oh, that's all right. So one has little round things on the end, and the other one doesn't, and they, they vibrate at different frequencies. So there's two different tuning forks. Uh, cotton tip applicators, that's so you can tell sensory side to side. You can tell soft ring things from pokey things. Uh, and then this was the handle for your uh, pinwheel. Yeah, so you've got those disposable pinwheels. Okay. Oh. So there are vials. You're going to fill these vials with different uh, different scents. Like they got you cinnamon, maybe coffee, uh, and you have the patient, you're checking the sense of smell. Cranial nerve two, if I remember right. No, one. It's one. Someone should have shouted it out a lot faster. This is like mathing out loud. Don't so math out loud. Uh, and then we've got a tape measure. We use tape measures as well for so lots of different things. One, you know, assessing uh, waist to hip ratio, things like that. But we also compare side to side to look for muscle atrophy as part of the neurology. I think that's it. Oh, the alcohol swabs. Oh, the alcohol swabs to keep it all nice and complete. Oh, I did not get the mic. So this, uh, this right here is a pin light. We use that for checking the eyes that you hold the light. Uh, this is the light But now, this is our question. Where is it? No, it's in the first day. Oh, that was in the first day. There you go. Yeah, so we, we use that. I use the physiology along with the sphygmometer. And the set. Uh, so, So make sure uh, you keep those the, the ear looker parts clean, the otoscope parts clean, so she's only got four. And then do we stock those in the clinic, or do they need to purchase those as well? Okay, so those are stocked in the clinic. But as you're practicing, just be mindful of how many have. And I believe we also have those in our bookstore. So just keep that in mind. We don't want to put those. Uh, having said that, I know when I grabbed my first doctor bag and I learned how to use the tools, I should say that, I learned how to use the tools because I know you guys have not taken the diagnosis. Uh, but I went to a family dinner and I looked at everybody's eyes and ears just to get practice once they taught me how to do it. And, and that is something you may practice. There are things that you may not practice without supervision, like the adjustment, but there are things that you can. And once you learn how to use these tools, you can practice with each other and family and friends and kids. All right, that wraps up our doctor bag ceremony. I'm going to pass the mic to the out now to wrap this up. Okay, guys, a couple of quick housekeeping things. 
So I'm going to run down the list real quickly again and give you the quantities of everything that you're supposed to have. If you are missing anything from your bag, please make sure you check with us before you leave the room to get it. Once you leave the room with these bags, you do not provide any replacement items, okay? So if you don't have it in the bag, we need to know before you go. You also want to make sure to probably put your name inside your bag to something somewhere. People tend to leave them laying around out in the buildings, in the huddle room. And if someone finds your bag, we want to make sure that we can get it back to you. Um, they're uh, usually when they get found, they get turned into the security office. So just in case you somehow misplace yours, they, they get turned into our security office and they hold them. If your name is in it, we can get it back to you a lot faster. Okay. Quick rundown of the items in the bag. You should have three pinwheel heads. Those are the little gray round things that look like they have spikes on them. And you should have a handle for your pinwheel, which is just a little slim metal pole. Uh, you should also have a tape measure. You should have a thermometer in a box. You should have two tuning forks that are shaped differently, a 128C and a 512C. You should have three cotton tip applicators. You should have three wooden tongue depressors. You should have a box of alcohol prep pads. You should have your otoscope in the box. Now, your box may look a little different from some other people's boxes. The packaging changed, but the inside is still the same. So if your box is a different color, don't panic. Uh, it's still the same equipment. Um, you should have three glass vials, and you should have a pen light in your bag. If you're missing any of those things, please make sure you see Alex up front here. We'll make sure that you get the items that you have. Or that you're missing. Okay, yeah, so the pin lights might be either white or blue. Don't panic, it's still the same thing. It's just, like I said, manufacturers change packaging on us sometimes. Okay, all right. If you guys have everything in your bags that you're supposed to have, thank you so much for joining us today. Congratulations that you guys prepared to move into Tri-4, and please let us know as soon as there is anything we can do to support